from the hesitant painter to the internationally renowned artist whose solo exhibits have graced art galleries in Vancouver, New York, Barcelona, and Paris, and are part of the permanent collections of great museums and galleries like the National Gallery of Canada. From the young university lecturer to the respected professor and department head inspiring scores of students. From the new Baha'i introduced to the faith by his wife Barbara, to the fiery teacher of the faith, making his house in Saskatoon into a Baha'i center of learning and helping the Baha'i community of Saskatoon blossom from less than 30 to 300 in just three years. To the distinguished servant of the Baha'i administrative order, first serving as an assembly member, a member of the auxiliary board, then as an appointee of the Universal House of Justice, serving first as a continental councillor, then for two terms as an international councillor in Haifa. Before coming back to Canada and being elected for several years to the National Hospital Assembly of the Baha'is of Canada after a short respite. Maybe the secret of Otto Rogers' uncanny ability to balance his career, his art, his service, and his commitment to the faith and Baha'u'llah, and being each to ever higher levels of accomplishment, lies in this deceptively simple affirmation that, and I quote, within the creative act lies the anticipation of assistance. Please welcome this year Hassan Balusi Memorial Lecture, Otto Donald Rogers. I don't remember doing any of that. <laughs> well, I gave a lot of thought to what I might say on this occasion, and I really appreciate the opportunity that given to me by the Association for Baha'i Studies. I uh, decided to really make a commentary rather than what you might call a, a thesis. And I thought about two things that have really concerned me, and that is the mystic wayfarer and the grammarian because I think that in each of us we have aspects of both of those conditions. On the one hand we want to enthusiastically and with great zeal embrace the unknown, uh, wander in a kind of invisible path in the hopes of being confirmed in that service. And on the other hand, we sometimes overcalculate or hesitate and are afraid of going over the edge. So that's why I gave the presentation that title. I want to first of all make mention of my parents Otto Victor and Mary Jane Rogers, because they were quite simple people by today's standards, and yet they made it possible for me to have an education in art and ultimately to embrace the teachings of Baha'u'llah. My father was a prairie wheat farmer in Western Canada, and he really related to the land as a poet would. He placed a loving hand on nature and he longed for a beautiful return. My mother, on the other hand, labored to achieve order in the unpredictable environment of dry land farming. They had a good marriage and so as a youth, 
I came to understand that if you married poetry and order, you would be in very good hands. And so when I embraced my gift as an artist, it seemed quite logical because it consisted of striving for order and being poetically uh, intoxicated. So that was my beginning. And naturally, when I discovered the Baha'i teachings, again, there was the confirmation of the majesty and beauty, the artistry, uh, along with everything else, of Baha'u'llah's writings, his entire revelation, and all of the teachings were so beautiful and of such aesthetic merit. And then, of course, there is the whole idea of order which appealed so much to my mind and my soul. So I came to understand that art was really necessary for the development of higher consciousness. And I'm not sure that it is um, as fully appreciated as it might be. We think of it as a, a decorative thing, but not necessarily as a means of education, as a means of making consciousness higher. So I am going to be, as I speak, I'm having a, a backdrop of eight of my most recent works. I don't intend to speak about them directly, but I thought it was very interesting to do it in this manner. And each set, there, there will be uh, altogether four sets. And they will remain on the screen in, before you for 15 minutes. Now this, if you don't like the works, may seem like a bit of a torture. <laughs> However, uh, for the artist, we often lament the fact that people go to the gallery and look at the title of a work and then glance at the work and walk on. And we may be losing our ability to appreciate the static form, the form that is still. And I'm very much moved by some of the statements in the writings of the Bob where he speaks about uh, motion as one condition of the divine creative act and stillness as another condition of the divine creative act. And then he says that in reality, motion and stillness are one. And this is one of the great beauties of pictorial art, of static art, because it symbolizes and actually presents you with motion and stillness simultaneously. But you have to um, spend some time with it and take it in and allow that motion to begin to enter your consciousness and to begin to appreciate the stillness that it has. I sometimes think in terms of the statement of Christ, the kind of peace that passes beyond all understanding. But the whole nature of pictorial art has to do with this creation of motion and stillness and the peace, an inner peace that elevates the soul and goes beyond all understanding. I am constantly amazed, and perhaps this is true of every discipline. I know it's certainly true of, of my discipline of painting that the revelation of Baha'u'llah simply surrounds it and elevates it and pushes it forward into the future. It's um, full of the very same things that the revelation is full of. And this is what's so confirming. Perhaps all professions are that way. So I had four thoughts 
or four elements that I wanted to just briefly touch on. These four elements I hope to develop into um, an essay that uh, the association may want to publish in its journal because I think it would be very good for people to understand that the artistic process is running parallel or is encompassed by Baha'u'llah's revelation and indeed our plans are artistic in nature as conceived by the Universal House of Justice. They are really an attempt to raise consciousness to the level of activity which will produce an object, objectification of that consciousness, which is our core activities. So you could really say that we have a plan at work in the world to raise consciousness and objectify it, really to create what in the art world we call high art. It's, it goes beyond that, of course, because this is the, is the plan of God. But it's interesting to reflect on the similarities. So these four um, ideas or realities that I want to touch on, the first one is the tremendous gift that we have, that of the intellect. I don't know if we contemplate often enough how amazing we couldn't be appreciative enough if we got down on our knees every day and thanked our loving creator for providing us with the intellect. And the second thing is the opening, or you could think of it in many ways, an invitation. Really, we're given an intellect, but immediately after having received it, we find that embedded in that intellect is a desire to move into the unknown, to embrace the unknown, to, to be attracted to the invisible, uh, to the spiritual world. It's almost as if we were given the means and the capacity whereby to move through that space, which is an unknown kind of space, and takes a tremendous amount of courage just to go through the very first veil let alone all the other veils that, that uh, intervene over the course of our life. So I want to speak a little bit about uh, the spatial element, which is, of course, again, another uh, primary concern of the pictorial artist, because without space, you have nothing. And the third concern is that of process. And I'm very much moved. I haven't in any way been able to digest it, but I have read the new book by um, uh, Nader Seed, Seed uh, Understanding the Writings of the Bob, The Gate of the Heart. And uh, this is so moving because he has one entire section explaining the writings of the Bob that have to do with, with divine creative action. And I want to make mention of that. So there's a wonderful process. Much of uh, what the artist does has to do with the outcome of a particular process that the artist initiates in a given set of paintings. The fourth concern uh, is that of form. In, in the art world, they speak about significant form or high art, significant form is the kind of form, it's kind of like an archetype. It has the capacity to generate all kinds of other works of art, and it raises consciousness, it elevates the human soul, and it is timeless. You look at it and you think, this was done yesterday. You blink and you look and you think, no, this is something ancient. It's something that has always been. So those are my four concerns. I want to first touch on mind. I know that we all, as Baha'is, know these things, but it doesn't hurt to come together on different occasions like this one and uh, remind ourselves. 
and experience it again together. Baha'u'llah says that this supreme emblem of God stands first in order of creation and first in rank, taking precedence over all created things. Witness to it is the holy tradition. Before all else, God created the mind. From the dawn of creation, it was made to be revealed in the temple of man. Mind is what is essential in the human spirit, but it's very interesting that even with this tremendous gift, it does not accomplish very much unless it is married to the spirit of faith. Then it can move mountains. But this tremendous gift of God can remain static without too much result, or perhaps maybe some material result, but in the end it doesn't fulfill its potential unless it is combined with the spirit of faith. Abdu Baha said the first attribute of perfection is learning and the cultural attainments of the mind. This is why I, I really <clears throat> want to stress, not that I necessarily need to prove it to you, but the importance of aesthetics in the development of the mind. The study of what is beautiful. We know this, of course, from the revelation itself, because it is pure beauty. From the dawn of creation, it was made to be revealed in the temple of man. That is an amazing statement because it would appear from that a statement, unless I'm misunderstanding it, that mind was something created by God and then associated or deposited in the human temple. So it has, it has a reality as a creation of God apart from the human temple, but it was created for the human temple and then uh, associated with that human temple. And then, of course, physically the brain was given to us as an instrument of that mind, so long as we are existing on this plane. And we know that this mind, without the spirit of faith, as I said, cannot move mountains but with the spirit of faith, it can. And that is why the power of the creative word <clears throat> is so great. Because the creative word fires the imagination and quickens the mind. I really think it restructures the mind. I think that this wonderful prayer, the Tabat Akma that we heard so beautifully sung and recited uh, before our session began. It was so moving. I, I really felt as if the very fiber of my being had been taken apart and reconstituted. And of course, that is what the creative word of God does. It restructures the mind. And that is why I think we are encouraged to commit it to memory. Because the mind is not a static thing. I want to touch on that later. It, it is evolving and changing. Its very architecture is capable, uh, they believe now, of changing over time, over our lifespan. So we know that the House of Justice in 1989 said to us, <clears throat> the Holy Word has been extolled by the prophets of God as the medium of celestial power. Just think of that, the medium of celestial power. Think of all of the things that humanity does to gain power. When in our very hands we have the medium, not just of physical power, but we have the medium of celestial power, the holy word of God. And they went on in this letter 
to explain that it was vital, of course, to personal transformation and to the emergence of divine civilization. A few years ago, a couple of decades ago, there was um, some experiments made on bird brains. And uh, it was very interesting because the first researcher that got involved did his research with the, braids, the birds um, locked up in cages. And he was trying to discover whether or not brain cells could be regenerated, that the, the, whether there was neurogenesis, because it was thought that you were, when you were born or when a creature was born, there were a certain number of, of uh, brain cells and that was it, that, that you had to make do with those for the rest of your life, that brain cells didn't regenerate. And his research actually proved that brain cells didn't regenerate until another researcher came along and did his research with birds in a supportive environment, a natural environment, and discovered that not only did the, the neurons regenerate, that the rate at which they regenerated was quite amazing, something like 3% of the total every day. And that this made it possible for the birds to sing. Uh, after a certain period of time, the birds in the cages lose their capacity to sing because the brain cells are not being regenerated. I think that this is a kind of an interesting metaphor, if you like, or an analogy. A lot of the things I want to mention tonight are really um, kind of a in, a, in the sense of a metaphor, they're not necessarily a complete dissertation uh, or necessarily, I don't have all of the scientific evidence, but they stand as um, quite convincing metaphors. So I was thinking of this in relationship to the creative word of God, how that creates an environment and an atmosphere within which I would imagine they'll get around to proving actually that that environment has a profound effect on the brain. Mind you, the brain is only an instrument for the mind, but it's a very <laughs> important one so long as we are on this plane of existence. So we should be so appreciative and careful of this trust of the intellect. In fact, Baha'u'llah says, O ye that have minds to know, raise up your supple in hands to the heaven of the one God and humble yourselves and be lowly before him and thank him for this supreme endowment and implore him to succor us until in this present age Godlike impulses may radiate from the conscious of mankind, conscience of mankind. And this divinely kindled fire, which has been entrusted to the human heart, may never die away. It's so beautiful that he connects the gift of intellect to the human heart and makes it one thing. So. I want to just mention briefly then the relationship of mind to art because sometimes people have felt that art is sometimes called self-expression. Uh, even artists are sometimes excused for not thinking very clearly and uh, because they are poets and they don't have to think. It's not really a thing of the mind, it's uh, self-expression. So one philosopher, Hegel, said, to be truly beautiful, a thing must be a product of the mind. And the mind is spiritual. Therefore, the art that is produced is spiritual. And then he relates it to nature. He says, the beauty of nature becomes an aspect of mind a reflection of the beauty of mind. 
and even goes so far as to say, which I think we can understand, that nature by itself is incomplete and imperfect in itself. And the real substance of nature is contained in the mind. And that's not too surprising for we who are Baha'is, because Baha'u'llah said, do you, do you think that you are a puny form when within you the universe is unfolded? So the, the way in which our mind is actually constructed, it would appear, is along similar lines to the principles of nature itself. And that's why we find nature so appealing. It really, it's the mind that uh, is so attracted to nature because the mind is constituted in a manner uh, of nature. And, and for art, it's always very interesting because there's always this dilemma on the part of the public. They expect the artist to mimic nature. Uh, and one uh, thinker put it very interestingly. He said that art is man's nature and nature is God's art. It's an interesting way of thinking about it. The, the nature of man is really expressed. In other words, the mind, the intellect. And in the Bob's writings, apparently, from this wonderful new book, Understanding the Writings of the Bob, the, the Bob has made it very clear that the entire universe it seems, was brought into existence to delight the human heart. We talk a lot about uh, the world order of Baha'u'llah, but maybe we haven't understood the, the effect that will occur in the future of the twin revelations. Because the Bob's revelation has to do with the heart being intoxicated. And you can't have a world order unless the hearts of its citizens are intoxicated, at least not a world order as envisioned by Baha'u'llah. The hearts have to have zeal and they have to be intoxicated. And the entire world of nature has been brought into existence apparently to delight the human heart. Also, of course, to inform the mind because as we investigate the natural phenomena that exists, uh, we also uh, advanced civilization and, and the mind becomes more and more developed. Uh, uh, greater levels of consciousness are reached. The other really interesting uh, relationship is uh, to prove that if you need proof that art is a spiritual enterprise, of course everything we do is a spiritual enterprise if it's done in the right spirit, but Abdu'l-Bahá says that no phenomenal organism can be possessed of two forms at one time. In other words, if a tree is a, being a tree, it can only be a tree while it's being a tree. But he says the reality of man, the human spirit, is simultaneously possessed of all forms and figures without being bereft of any of them. It does not require transformation from one concept to another. This is the, the spiritual nature of ourselves. And this is really interesting in relationship to painting because in a painting, I will, I will give the example of Mark Toby since some of you may know Mark Toby's paintings and on uh, the other evening we saw some images projected. When you look at a Mark Toby painting, maybe the first thing you see is the texture of the painting. And then you blink your eyes and you see light. And then you look again and you see form. Thus the texture of a Mark Toby painting is not only composition, but it is also a means of holding the light. An effect in one part of the composition can appear as light, while in another it may appear as a shape. We perceive in the white writing form, an illumination, a tactical presence. We experience pattern, movement, and space all at the same time executed with material 
convincingly rational, but essentially spiritual. This is the process of art. And also, by the way, I think not to bring down what we're doing and try to say it's, it's nothing but art, but the activity that the Baha'i world community is engaged in, one could say the very same thing. It's, it's essentially spiritual in nature. So it's multiple in its effect simultaneously. A person can be embracing the faith and learning of its history and, and acquiring zest for service in an instant because it's spiritual. It's not just one thing. You're not just acquiring history. So these parts function in multiple ways. They become signs, spiritual discoveries. Every painting of Mark Toby is a kind of spiritual discovery. As Baha'u'llah says, we will surely show them signs in the world and within themselves. And I love what Abdu'l Baha speaks about the singer because uh, this speaks of the mysterious connection between things, the invisible connection, because he says that really nothing leaves the singer and enters another person that is listening to the singer. There is no actual transfer of anything material. Nothing comes forth from the singer which enters into the listener. Nevertheless, a great spiritual effect is produced. Therefore, surely so great a connection between beings must have spiritual effect and influence. And then he says, although by existing rules and actual science, these connections cannot be discovered. Nevertheless, their existence between all beings is certain and absolute. All beings, great or small, are connected with one another by the perfect wisdom of God and affect and influence one another. So there's this relationship. Relationships are something that fascinate me because uh, a painting is simply a set of relationships. And the amount of understanding or knowledge that comes about. In fact, the way, the way in which we became conscious in the first place was because we started comparing things. We saw that one thing looked this way or we experienced night and we experienced day and we took note of the difference between night and day and this raised our consciousness. So comparisons, relationships are very important to developing consciousness. So the artist is constantly in the, in, within the pictorial space working out relationships in the hope that the uh, space between these relationships will somehow become filled with meaning. This is a fascinating thing, the whole idea of space and what space actually is and they don't know yet. The scientists don't know. They used to call it ether, and now sometimes they call it the dark force. And many other, there's all kinds of investigations going on. Perhaps one day they'll actually prove what Baha'u'llah said, that it is an actual fact, the love of God, which is so fantastic an idea, and so, uh, um, well, so fantastic, that uh, it would be hard, uh, hard to believe it, but he did say that if the love of God were to be withdrawn, the physical universe would collapse. And I think although Baha'u'llah's writings, of course, are tremendously uh, aesthetically beautiful, they are poetic, they're also accurate. They're not just metaphors, they have accuracy. And uh, so this whole idea of space is to an artist fascinating, but it's frightening also because we have to be courageous in order to enter into that relationship with space. And I think that this is what was being talked about 
in the Seven Valleys. Uh, when the mystic wayfarer, when they arrived at this great sea, which I envision as a vast space, un, almost undefined, the mystic knower knew immediately that this space contained uh, what it was that he desired, and so he immediately entered into it without hesitation. Whereas the grammarian hesitated, and of course we do that all the time. I don't think it's an either or. I think, you know, some of the time we're hesitating, some of the time we are uh, going over the edge. And of course, every time that we do go over the edge, we're astounded at the results. But nevertheless, it always requires a great degree of courage. And I think in order to move into that space, we have to clear the deck, so to speak. And often we are so preoccupied, uh, so filled with concerns and anxieties and um, maybe even duties or plans. Maybe we can over plan at times that we are so filled up that we have used up all the space. We can't enter the space because we have blocked, we have blocked it out. And yet on the other side of that veil, tremendous victories are waiting for us. Whether they be a painting or whatever achievement within the faith that we want to uh, carry out, they exist. I walk into the studio and I see an empty canvas. Recently I had some large canvases constructed for me, five by seven feet, uh, which is 35 square feet of surface to keep alive. <clears throat> because the surface of a painting has to be sustained in time and in space. And believe me, it's not easy. To keep it vibrating on the surface and to hold it together so that it doesn't fly off the edges, like a good piece of music from an instrument that is well-tuned. It's absolutely precise. It sings, it vibrates just in the right fashion because all of the parts are connected and that tension, they call it um, uh, significant form that tension is, is held. So the space and how we use it is very important, but it's not easy to enter it because it, a big blank canvas is rather frightening. So this is why the mystic knower said, uh, the death of self is needed here, not rhetoric. Be nothing then and walk upon the waves. So you see, it's possible. And I think about this every time I go into the studio because I, the way I work, I have absolutely no idea what the painting is going to look like, how it's going to evolve. It isn't that I'm mindless because I bring my mind to that edge and then I allow the process to move me forward. I run very hard to stay behind the process, to keep up with it. I don't try to control it um, because the process has a, almost a mind of its own or it has a motion of its own which we intelligently have to follow and, and enhance. Cezanne, the great painter, modern, uh, sometimes referred to as the father, of modern painting, at least in the Western sense, said that if I think I'm lost, and he didn't mean to say that, that we should abandon our rational intellect. No, but our rational intellect brings us to the point at which we can intelligently, in a sense, abandon it, or at least set ourselves free from its limitations and allow the process to educate us. And it does every time. This is the amazing thing. This is the brilliance, not that anybody needs any proof, the infallible brilliance of the Universal House of Justice because they have presented us with a plan that from every standpoint is totally amazing. 
And if you were a very uh, educated and uh, experienced artist and you investigated the plan of the House of Justice, you would be completely satisfied that it meets all of the criteria of great works of art. This is what's so amazing and confirming as a, to me as an artist. Now, Cezanne, uh, I don't think anybody's paintings are more rational or more intellectual than Cezanne's. But nevertheless, he said, if I think I'm lost. And um, it's interesting because in Cezanne's uh, paintings of mountains, he was one of the first people to start leaving white gaps or blank spaces in between the various brush strokes and clusters. There was a lot of empty canvas. And um, writers have said that it made it possible for the mind to move into those empty spaces and occupy them. And at the same time as Cezanne was making these paintings, the physicists were beginning to discover that space wasn't simply a curtain that hung behind everything, that, that everything was in space and space was in everything. And their whole new concept of space that a physicist could, could explain to you better than I. But I was interested in um, this whole idea in relationship to some recent research on brain functions. Because again, getting back to the neurons, it was thought that neurons, and by the way, in case you don't know, you have something like two billion of them in your brain. Imagine two billion neurons in every human brain. And they used to think that they were all connected together in one string, like an electrical wire, and, and then connected into a central location somewhere. And then with the development of um, uh, high-powered microscopes, they were able to discover that each neuron was bounded by its own membrane. Every one of these two billion neurons are a separate entity bound by a membrane. And so then they were really perplexed because they said to themselves, well, then how do they communicate? Because every memory um, takes place because of a chain, uh, because of a connection, uh, a changed, because of a changed connection between two neurons or a cluster, one cluster of neurons and another cluster of neurons. Every memory, every thought requires a, a connection between the two. So if they, are, if they are bound by a membrane, how do they, how do they connect? So if neurons do not touch each other, how do they form memories and exchange information? There's fascinating stuff about memories. By the way, you don't really remember anything because by the time you get around to remembering it, your brain has so completely changed it that it's not exactly what actually happened because your brain has changed in the meantime, apparently. That's why husbands and wives can never agree on, <laughs> on what certain experience happened and when it happened and who was there. <laughs> anyway, what, they, what the scientists have come, the conclusion is, this is very nice for myself as an artist, the conclusion is that, that the vacant gaps between the cells is where the information, the real information is taking place. And they even put a word on it, like scientists have a tendency to do. Synaptic clefts, they call it. And they say, and this is wonderful, these spaces are the secret sites of communication. The space between things. Look at my paintings, it's all the space between things. The painting is about the space between things. It's not about a landscape, it's not about uh, a tree, it's about the space between things. The way the dark on the one over on my right 
the black bar that's floating in the top, the, the little white island that's down on the bottom right-hand corner, the gray bar that's floating in the pink, the green bar that's floating in the pink, the relationship of the white to the black, the gray to the pink, the black to the brown, the close to the opening, the fast to the slow, the stillness to the motion. It's all of those things happening simultaneously. But if, you, if you're not educated in art, you miss it. And therefore, you miss an opportunity, I think, to elevate your consciousness, because aesthetics is essential for the elevation of consciousness. It's not an additional thing. It's not what we call culture, and it would be nice to have culture. Therefore, let's buy a painting and hang it above our couch. It's not, I mean, it is that, it is that, it, it is. There's nothing wrong with that. Ornament, ornamentation is, is fine, but it's more than that. Understanding and experiencing the process, taking it into the consciousness, is vital in terms of the advancement of society. Well, it's always been that way, hasn't it? Every culture, every civilization um, elevated its people and advanced its civilization and uh, imbued its spiritual principles by means of aesthetics, by, by one of the means, and often one of the main means. So the house has asked us for a new mind. So I think we have to consider aesthetics as an aspect of building that new mind and do a lot more, perhaps, uh, if we can, than we have been doing. So the other thing that they're discovering that uh, <laughs> I don't understand, but it, I'm fascinated nevertheless, that uh, you know this uh, conversation that's going on between the neurons across this space, that, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I noticed that with some of the other speakers. Is it happening all the time or just? Okay. Um, that um, while this conversation is going on between the neurons, actually, obviously, some time is passing. And so they're getting into investigation of how time, the passage of time, and the conversation of these neurons actually begins to reconstitute the architecture of the brain. So it's quite possible that in the future, you know, through all of the means that we will develop and science will develop and the, the uh, memorization of the creative word and all of that, it's unbelievable where we will go. So what happens in a painting is that there are all of these elements. And they seem to, over time, as you work on the painting, they seem to become uh, enfolded in... Oh, sorry, now I'm not speaking into it. <laughs> sorry about that. It's. Um, now I lost my train of thought. You see, it's that uh, giving a talk, by the way, is very much like making a painting. You have a relationship between the speaker and the audience, and you have a space between. And believe me, as any of you know that have tried to give a presentation, it's quite a frightening thing to cross the veil and engage the audience and still hold your own ground. And... Uh, transmit from one set of relationships to another set of relationships, cross that space, and create meaning. It's not an easy thing. So uh, I'm wavering around here in front of the microphone. So for the artist, it's, uh, it's a physical and a spiritual progress process. In the words of Abdu'l Baha, and this is a lovely thing, it is said that Moses in the wilderness heard the voice of God. But that wilderness, that holy land, was his own heart. It's not interesting that he would say that about Moses, that that wilderness was his own heart. All of us, when we attain, this is Abdu'l-Bahá still speaking, 
All of us, when we attain to a true spiritual condition, can hear the voice of God speaking to us in that wilderness. So I think that the artist and uh, I would say the Baha'i seeks to so order a composition that it can reflect to us the light of spirit. Now, there's much more to be said about space, but I want to mention now process, and I think that we naturally have a fear of process because we have a sense of how majestic it is, and we're a little bit afraid we might lose our identity, and so we hold back. We don't plunge ourselves into this unknown sea because it's a fearful plunge to take. And we are quite precious about our identity, as we maybe should be. It probably is important to maintain our identity. Maybe we would lose our uh, mental faculties if we didn't con you know, uh, hang on in a certain way. But the interesting thing is that it seems as though it's impossible to sacrifice. You only think you're sacrificing. So you never really do relinquish your sanity. But nevertheless, the fear is real. Um, but in nature, you know, we, everybody loves waterfalls. And I think because they really are a metaphor or a symbol for us, we really see ourselves in the waterfall and we envy the waterfall because when the waterfall comes to the edge, it goes over it. It doesn't hold back. Fortunately, it doesn't have free will. I mean, fortunately for it. And fortunately for us, we do have <laughs> free will because consciousness is choice. If you stand on the edge and you don't go over, that's a choice. And the architecture of your mind, your consciousness, is going to be determined. Your destiny is going to be determined by whether or not you make certain choices or also by the choices you do make. So the waterfall just goes over the edge and it experiences a lot of turmoil. It falls over the rocks, it foams up, it uh, changes its form, it's quite agitated, but eventually it reaches an entirely new form, whether it's a lake or whatever, and it realizes, I am the same. I'm still the water. I'm still water. But I have a new form. I've been transformed. I haven't lost my identity. And if we could, it's a simple analogy, but if we could use it, it's still going to be hard. I found that every person that I tried to interest in the faith in my life as a, as a Baha'i teacher, that there was always this moment of standing on the edge and um, helping that person to take that jump, and you had to take the jump with them. So we in the process are really one. One of these scientists said, um, Freeman Dyson, said, the more I examine the universe and study the details of its architecture, the more evidence I find that the universe, in some sense, must have known that we were coming. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Must have known that we were coming. So you see, if you relinquish a little bit of control and fear and go through the space, you'll find that the process was waiting for you. And all of the things that you will need will be there. I can guarantee it. On the little bit of experience that I've had, I can guarantee you that everything you need is there. But the trouble is, it has to be conscious because God doesn't want a bunch of zombies. So you have to stand on the edge, make a choice, hold your breath and jump. 
I'll, no, I'll give you another example, which is a nice example. There was um, recent research done on a certain kind of butterfly uh, that the, these butterflies migrated to a, a new region where they hadn't existed before. And um, promptly began to be eaten in mass by the birds. Now, in that same region, there was another species of butterfly that the birds did not eat. In fact, they tasted apparently very sour. And so the birds had learned over time not to eat them. Now, this new flock of butterflies that had migrated, if you can believe it, and they don't know how they did it, they changed their coloration completely to imitate the butterflies in that region who tasted sour, who, which tasted sour. Right down to a little speck of black on the underside of the left wing that was so small you could barely see it. You would need a magnifying glass to see it. They mimicked the exact coloration of that other uh, species of butterflies, and the birds stopped eating them, even though they didn't taste sour. I, I think of ourselves in that way. We have to be careful that we're not eaten. Uh, we better change our colors and, and fit in with the guidance <laughs> of the Universal House of Justice, because we're migrating. It's a new process. We're migrating. Um, but the other result of this research, which, which I found even more fascinating, was that evolution has the power to constantly make changes, adjust to whatever the requirements of the moment are. The process of evolution has built right into it the capability for endless variation, variety, and change. However, this is the beautiful thing that the sacred template is inalterable. It cannot be changed. It's sacred. It can never be destroyed. So the, the system or the evolutionary process that produced the butterflies in the first place, they radically changed their coloration, but they could not change the way in which species evolve. Or I mean the, the built-in process was a divine sacred template that is inalterable. And I thought this is a marvelous way to explain progressive revelation because uh, religion is a phenomenon, is a process which is, can undergo constant change and adaptation to the needs of the age. But the sacred template is inalterable. It's still the religion of God, eternal in the, in the past and eternal in the future, as Baha'u'llah said. So there's, there's lots of evidence, um, even uh, in the scientific world, that we can, can use to understand uh, what we are about. Abdu'l-Bahá says that all sciences, knowledge, enterprises come from the exercised intelligence of the rational soul. That's why I used that sentence from Abdu'l-Bahá in an essay that I wrote in this book that was published on my paintings. Because, um, because he says that the first condition of perception, and to an artist, the whole idea of perception is very powerful because it means to, to see and to be moved by. And he says, the first condition of perception in the world of nature is the rational soul. To exercise the intelligence of the rational soul indicates the importance of engaging aesthetic awareness. The principles of beauty do not stand apart from the intellect. Rather, they are part of the very nature of intelligence. There was a very interesting thing about light that I, I want to go back and, uh, and share with you. You know, uh, one of the great architects of America, Louis Kahn, 
uh, spoke about how a beautiful form, a beautiful building, or any beautiful form doesn't really know that it's beautiful because it has no way of seeing its own beauty. But the moment it invites light to enter in, and he was talking about the importance of windows in architecture, that the window brings light into the inner form of the building, and the light envelops the form. The form becomes aware, so to speak, of its own beauty, and the light becomes aware of its own reality because it has a form within which to relate. So even in physical relationships of light in terms of an architectural work, you have this idea of illumination, this wonderful duality of everything, uh, illumination in terms of the creative word of God is, is the equivalent of the physical light being invited, entered into the form and transforming the form and telling the form how beautiful it is or demonstrating how beautiful the form is. Look at how beautiful this individual was that stood before us and played his music and recited the Tablet of Achman. I mean, we saw the beauty of that soul. We experienced the beauty of that soul because that soul had invited the light to enter it. And the light was entering it and describing it and we were experiencing it. That's art. We experienced art. You wouldn't have needed this presentation at all. However, I was invited, so here I am. Uh, now, about process, obviously it's difficult. It's a combination of order, preparation, Conscious knowledge, it has to be imaginative, that's where we fall down. The beloved hand of the cause of God, Amitabhari Hanum, she used to tell us so often, the Baha'is don't lack sincerity, they lack imagination. If they could only imagine more, we could accomplish so much more. So the poetic aspect of every endeavor is absolutely crucial to success. Because without poetry, there's no intoxication. And we seem to like to be intoxicated, or, or we need to be. We are designed to be intoxicated. That's why, imagine if God brought the entire universe into existence to, to delight the human heart. The extent to which the uh, all-loving creator has gone to delight us and to intoxicate us, to give us zeal, enthusiasm, that's a tall order. The universe is, is rather large. Two billion suns in our galaxy, which is considered one of the smaller galaxies. Two billion suns. Now I was inspired by Philippi, I'm mispronouncing it, Petit, a French tightrope walker who strung a guy wire between the Twin Towers in New York and walked across it, if you can believe it. And uh, the security people uh, rushed up to take him off the wire. And he came within three feet of the edge of one of the buildings, uh, waved at them, laughed, turned around, and ran back to the middle of the wire. And this was very beautiful. He's, he, uh, there's a documentary on, it's called Man on, Man on the Wire. It won the documentary award at the uh, Academy Awards last year for best documentary, Man on, Man on the Wire. <clears throat> he said, you know, he, he was doing this uh, as a symbolic gesture. He wanted to connect people's hearts. And so he thought that if he strung this wire and took this risk of life and, and, and really, he had a hard time because there were so many times during the preparation that he doubted that he could do it. He prepared for six years. He saw a, a drawing in a magazine in the dentist office of the Twin Towers. And he determined right, right in the dentist office that he was going to uh, string a wire 
and walk between them. And for six years he studied. He went to the building and visited a number of times while it was under construction. Sorry, <laughs> while it was under construction. <laughs> uh, and uh, he examined every aspect of the building. And he tested the wind that he could expect. It, it was very rigorous. I, I kind of thought of it in the same way that that uh, that the Baha'i world community tested uh, the whole process of teaching and consolidation for all those years and we gathered all the information that was necessary and now we can walk the tightrope because we've, we've, we've prepared, we're prepared, we can do it now. And he had to suspend his disbelief. It's a famous philosophic statement, the suspension of disbelief. And he had doubts. And you know what he said? This is not a stunt. It's a desire to carry my life through a difficult process by the means of art. Uh, he was a bit of a radical, but such a heart. I want to connect the hearts of these two buildings. I want to make a symbol. Well, they arrested him. He said the most frightening thing of the whole thing was being arrested and pushed down the stairs. And then later on, they gave him the key to New York, and they honored him, and uh, he, he uh, moved to to, United, to the United States. So this is a little bit about process. Not very much, but it touches on the subject. Now the idea of form, because consciousness has to arrive at a point where it has some kind of substance, some kind of reality that you can touch. It's one thing to have the intellect, it's another thing to have the courage to move through space and to adopt methodologies of process, but all of those three factors have to conclude by building something that is going to influence civilization or that will be uh, civilizing. Ourselves with this current plan, the core activities are really uh, blocks that build civilization. When you think about it, and when you think of the uh, de degree of deterioration in the present civilization, and then you look at the core activities, what are the elements of civilization? Obviously, they're, they're learning, and we're better to learn than with the creative word of God. They're learning, they're with the children, they're with the youth, and they're with the adoration and devotion to God. This is the very foundation of civilization. And on, upon this, as we do a good job of this, more and more capacities can be added to those core things, but we have to do the core ones first. I love um, uh, Nidhar Said. His uh, section of the book, Gate of the Heart, concerning the stages of divine creative action. Because he, he talks about the treatise that the Bob wrote on grammar, and where he says that in the future, children will be taught uh, the spiritual foundation of grammar. And uh, he mentions the idea of verb and nouns and the preposition, which is the connecting link between verb and noun. And then he says that the verb is like our will, and the noun is determination, and the preposition is our destiny, because it's the connection between will and determination. Without will and determination, there's no connection, there's no relationship. So will and determination connect in that space, and that space is our destiny. This is the frightening thing. If you don't move into that space, you don't realize your destiny. I remember one night in the pilgrim house, Hooper Dunbar saying that if, if you don't make your contribution to the Baha'i cause, uh, that contribution will never be made 
because no one else can make your particular um, contribution because your contribution is totally unique. It's a result of your will, your determination, it's your destiny. So your destiny is your contribution. The faith will go on and make tremendous progress, but it will forever be deprived of your contribution. And that's a sobering thought. For human beings, true destiny <clears throat> is the agreement of their own will with the divine will. That's the struggle. It's even a struggle, believe it or not, at the level of an artist. Because you have your own struggle, you have your own idea. You, you, you kind of want to will the painting. Some of my paintings I try to force to become a good painting. I think about them, I work on them. I try to will them into existence, just with will alone. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because there's no harmony with the divine will. I'm not suggesting that my paintings are a result of the direct intervention of the divine will. I'm not so foolish as to make that claim. But, but the writings do say that the celestial concourse, that, that the Holy Spirit, works of art come into existence because of the working of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not too far off. I just don't claim direct uh, connection to the divine will, but the celestial concourse is there. So for human beings, in anything you do, your profession or in the cause, for human beings, destiny is the agreement of your own will with the divine will. The realm of the heart as the throne of God and the agreement of the individual with the divine will. And as Baha'u'llah says, all that ye potentially possess, however, is manifested only as a result of your own volition. Your own acts testify to this truth. Now, just another word about objectivity of consciousness or objectifying consciousness. I love what the uh, philosopher Chardin mentions because it seems to me that he was describing what the Baha'i world community is now engaged in. Although it's kind of fancy words, I mean it's a bit complicated, or seemingly so, but actually it isn't. Uh, and this is out of context a bit, but I think you'll get the idea very easily. He says, from our exper experimental point of view, reflection is, there's the word reflection, Reflection is, as the word indicates, the power acquired by the consciousness to turn in upon itself, to take possession of itself as an object. This is what fascinated me as an artist because really every work of art is the objectification of consciousness. And the more work you do, the more works of art you look at, the more greatness you expose yourself to, than the higher level of consciousness. But that consciousness will not remain with you. It, it dissipates very quickly unless you make it concrete. You have to do something with it. That's why in our present plan it's so beautifully, the activities are built right into the process. It's not, it's not a passive learning. You have to act. I could go into the studio every day and look at, stare at my canvas and the results would be nil. I have to act. I have to take my reflection, my consciousness, and act it out. If I don't act it out, there's no ob object. Then the beautiful thing is that when the object arrives, it becomes um, a form by which we can contemplate and even gain further consciousness. I look at my own art. It's not an egotistical thing, but I enjoy it. I learn from it because it, it has taken place as part of a process that's larger than I am, larger than, than, than I'm able to think at a given moment. And so it educates me. It's back and forth, back and forth. And this is exactly what our plan is, the, the, the reflection. I think of the clusters really as a unit of consciousness, as a work of art, as a unit of consciousness made up of all kinds 
of, of uh, points of relationships moving in the direction of higher consciousness, of a greater work of art. I don't want to compare the faith to art, but it's moving towards significant form. Let's put it that way. A cluster has to become a significant form, which has a consciousness which becomes like a mirror which attracts other people. This is what it is. People ask uh, uh, about paintings. What, why do I like a certain painting? Well, you like it because you see yourself in it. If a painting is good enough, it reflects universal principles. And when it reflects universal principles and you look at it because you are constituted by God um, with those universal principles, it's like looking in a mirror and you say, I really like this. What are you liking? You're liking your own nature. And if these clusters became units of consciousness that raised to the level of art, raised to the level of significant form, the people would see themselves reflected in it. They would love it because the universal principles that it contained are their principles. That's what, how they're made. And so they would just be naturally gravitated, attracted to it. So he, I just want to, don't want to uh, completely deviate from his statement because he goes on and he says um, that, uh, I think this is very interesting, by this individualization of himself in the depths of himself, well, this is a little bit, which, this is the part that I wanted to, which heretofore had been spread out and div divided over a diffuse circle of perceptions and activities. It's kind of like we, we, in our stage of developing, of acquiring the capacity for the present plan, we were involved in a diffuse circle of perceptions and activities. Isn't that true? For many decades, and when we, we, the House of Justice allowed us to do that in order to acquire consciousness about process so we would understand it. So this is what he's saying, that this business of being in a diffuse circle of perceptions and activities was constituted for the first time as a center in the form of a point at which all of the impressions and experiences knit themselves together and fuse into a unity that's conscious of its own organization. Doesn't that ring a bell? And it says, now the consequences of such a transformation are immense, visible as clearly in nature as in any of the facts recorded of physics or astronomy. Uh, I replaced his word being with community. The community who, which is the object of its own reflection in consequence of its very doubling back upon itself becomes in a flash able to raise itself into a new sphere. It's, it's a very beautiful analogy of what we're engaged in. Now, I want to conclude by uh, asking you to, to think about the plan as having this great beauty and, and think of it as all of you being artists because we all are artists. I didn't give the title to this presentation, The Artist and the Grammarian, by, by making the assumption that, that I as an artist was somehow superior. The, the artist that I was speaking about is the artist that we all are, the one that is standing at the edge of that space, fearful of going over the edge, fearful of losing our identity, and, and not relying to the extent necessary on the spirit of faith. Because um, as Pierre Yves read, I, I thought about this sentence very much. And within the, within the uh, creative act lies the expectation of being inspired, uh, lies the expectation of being assisted. It's guaranteed. Well, there are countless writings that guarantee it. So we, we don't need any further evidence of that. But I wanted to just make mention one thing, because I was really struck by the degree to which uh, uh, President Obama engaged millions, 
uh, through cyberspace. Whether this will result to anything or not, it's, it's doubtful in the long run because they will get tired and maybe drop out. In fact, an article today in the New York Times says, in fact, that's exactly happening, unfortunately, that his network of youth that were responding are not responding to the same extent. But you, uh, it is amazing, amazing to think that millions of souls responded on the simple basis of three words, hope and change and yes, we can. I mean, that is not exactly the creative word of God. <laughs> think, no, but I mean, think about the, the degree to which people came on board. And so what I am very concerned about, and it's not my medium, because I'm a hopelessly old-fashioned artist, but I'm really hoping that the youth would take up this challenge of engaging in spiritual conversations in cyberspace. But spiritual conversations that are elevated, that are aesthetically meritorious, they have to have excellence. And they can combine words, music, and images. And I, I was reminded of a statement in uh, some answered questions of Abdu'l Baha. He says that every semblance, every shape that perisheth today in the treasure house of time is safely stored away. When the world revolveth to its former place, out of the invisible, he draweth forth its face. And I was thinking of, in the medieval times, Christianity was spread rapidly by means of the woodcut. Most people were illiterate. A lot of people apparently today are illiterate. But at that time, the majority of people were illiterate. And so the woodcut could be easily multiplied. You know, they had simple printing presses and they multiplied woodcut by the thousands upon thousands that had images and words from the, uh, fr uh, from the Bible, text from the sayings of Christ. And this was how one of the major means by which Christianity was spread. Later on, this form evolved to a much higher form of illuminated manuscripts. And I had the thought that this maybe relates to what Habdaba is saying, or we could, it wouldn't matter even if we made a mistake and thought of it as re applying to that and acted on it. <laughs> we couldn't go wrong because uh, he says that out of the invisible, they're stored and can come back. So illuminated manuscripts can come back and be a tremendous force in spreading uh, the revelation of Baha'u'llah. And I asked uh, some people that are very much up in uh, uh, cyber network websites and so on, and I got a, quite a long list, and I looked up all of these websites, and I wasn't overly impressed, I'm sorry to say, because sometimes the artists would say, here I am, I'm an artist, I'm sitting in my studio, and these are my paintings, and I, I love Baha'u'llah, so I make these paintings but they weren't very good paintings. And also the site itself was not elegant. We had a speaker this morning who said that the necessity for elegance in everything that we do. And there wasn't this beautiful combination. I mean, even this tablet of Ahmed that we heard today set to music, um, it seems to me that, that countless websites could be developed by really uh, in the use of the intellect that the young people have and the skills, the artistic skills. And uh, millions of people could be reached that way. Now there's one young man in New Zealand that he has what he calls the Small Man Project. And it's quite clever. He's a lovely Baha'i, very deepened, and he's a trained artist. And he makes little sculptures of men. They're only about as high as a thimble, two inches high. And they're all red. They're cast in plastic, and he, he makes thousands of them. 
and, they, and they're grouped in three or four uh, st people standing, and they're holding a banner, and the banner says, look into the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran, and then a website is given. And he places these on park benches and on restaurant stools. It's not a public nuisance because they're so small. They're no bigger than if you would just, you know, uh, throw aside your, your uh, plastic spoon or something. They don't really, that's not really a public nuisance. And then people sit down on the park bench and they see these three little red men and they read the banner and they go and look up the website. He's had 7,000 hits. That's a lot. Now that was the only one that I found that I thought was, and, and I know there are many others. I know that there is um, a young woman who, is, who has developed um, games that employ spiritual principles and she has had a lot of hits. They're, they're wonderful. And eventually in time, this would have to be monitored and looked and we would have to come together in conferences probably and share them. And, uh, you know, people would need guidance and, and there's going to be mistakes made. But the House of Justice said we shouldn't fear uh, making mistakes and being experimental. So that, th this is a plea that I wanted to make to take this opportunity to make, especially to the young because we have been called upon by the Universal House of Justice to have spiritual conversations. And what better way to have them when you can bring the whole force of the creative word and aesthetic excellence to bear on them. So I want to conclude with this <clears throat> passage, which is a favorite of mine. However we do it, Baha'u'llah says, that which he hath reserved for himself are the cities of men's hearts. And of these, the loved ones of him who is the sovereign truth are in this day as the keys. Please God, they may one and all be enabled to unlock through the power of the most great name, the gates of these cities. Thank you.